I'm Steve for This Week With Cars, and today I'm at Dennis and Crystal Clem's place. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So, I've already taken a little peek around all the buildings here. They have so many cars that I can't even show you all of them. Right now we're standing in their workshop. This is where they restore the cars, put them back together. Off camera where you can't see right now is even more pre-war cars. Some MG 1100s, Austin Americas, even an old Plymouth back here. Uh, how'd you guys get into cars? Just happened in college. Plymouth was the first one I restored many, many years ago. And I found out I could put more MGs in the same space as a Plymouth. Yeah. That's kind of why I like the little cars as well. You can pack a lot of them in a small space. And it's dangerous when it gets to motorcycles because yeah. they're, they're even smaller. When you started the restoration on the Plymouth, did you have an MG or any foreign nope. cars? How did you get your first one? It just came available. You just saw it for sale. Yeah. didn't probably know a lot about it. Right. And you bought it and then ended up loving it? Yes. Yes. When I was in school, we worked with an import car dealer and he had an MGA sitting there that I just loved but there was no way to afford it so took years later before I could get one what was your first MG uh, MGB 74 okay. MGB a uh, convertible yep hey crystal obviously today you are really into these cars did, did were you into these cars or cars in general before you met him a little bit, but not to this extent. I, I liked cars, but not to the extent. What was your was. first car? Oh, my first car was a 1981 Buick Regal. Okay. <laughs> 80s. What was your first fun car that you've owned? Probably a Camaro. I, I had a Camaro. That was a fun car for me. I was in my 20s then, so. It was a manual transmission? Automatic. I don't, okay. I don't know Still how to don't drive. don't know how to drive a um, manual that well. Okay. He's been teaching me for some years. <laughs> Great. You guys are involved in the British Car Club out of Rockford. I think it's called the Boots and Bonnets Car Club. Correct. Um, are, are you currently the president of that club? And this you're the year. vice president mm -hmm. this year? Did you guys found that club or? No. No, no we're fairly new members. We've okay. been members for about three or four years there. Obviously, you've been taking cars to their shows for a, a long time, though. So we belong to multiple car clubs. Um, some we attend, some some we can't. So some are in the UK, so we can't attend a lot of those. But the ones that we're involved with locally, we take a select few of car select cars there. Of any of the car clubs that you are members of, which car club is your favorite? They're all, everyone in all of the clubs that we belong to locally, the, the Iowa Car Club, the um, Madison Car Club, and the Rockford Car Club, they're all all wonderful people there, so we like, we enjoy all of them. You guys have traveled over to England and been to MG shows over there? He no? has, I have. Years and years ago. Okay. It's been a long time. We're a member of the... Um, the Tea Club on the New England Tea Register. And we have a GOF every year in Central Midwest area. And coupled with that is the Triple M Register of all the pre-war MGs. So those shows are a big deal. Last year was in La Crosse, La Crosse, Wisconsin. This year it'll be in South Bend, Indiana. So Dennis, this is a really cool car. This is an Austin FX4, but this is a little bit different than FX4s that you're used to seeing. I, I used to have one that was a taxi cab, but this one actually isn't a taxi cab. Correct. So tell me about this car. It was a hire car made for a dentist in Milwaukee by the London Cab Company. They put it together and shipped it over for him to transport his elderly patients to his office. And I noticed that unlike the taxi cabs, it actually has a passenger seat in the front instead of the luggage area that you'd normally find. That's correct. And uh, obviously it doesn't have the little lights on the top and on the sides that the taxi cabs would have. But a lot more luxurious interior. Is there 
Any other differences between the taxi cabs and this? Well, none of the meterings yes. to the equipment would be there. Mm -hmm. And then it's been reupholstered in dental chair fabric. Okay. Which is why it's red. You guys drive this car often? Yes. What, what, you just go to dinner in it, or what do you go normally to, do? Go to breakfast, go to dinner, get it out when we have people here, other British car nuts, and yeah. just enjoy it. And you can have two people in the front, and then I think five or more in the back, right? In the right? back, yep. yep. Okay. So now we're in front of uh, Morris Cowley. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about these cars. Can you tell me about this one? This is 1926. Bullnose Morris, which is what old number one MG was based on. It's just a unique vehicle. We're in the process of putting a, a hood on it. We got the side curtains on it, which changes the car totally. Uh, one of the interesting things is, Steve, if you look, there's no doors on this side. Yeah, there's no doors. The only doors are on the other side, so you have to climb in and then scoot over. It's interesting that there's so many individual side curtains on the sides of this. Yes, unknown, but you got your little flap there yeah. to stick yep. your arm out to give your hand signals when you're driving down the road. Yeah, no trafficators on no, this one. No trafficators. How many of these do you think are still around? There's quite a few in England. We know of this one. There's one in Virginia and one in Canada. That's it that we know of through the Bullnose Morris Club. It's got two wheel brakes uh, in the rear only. Mm -hmm. And uh, the manual with the car says you can either use the foot pedal or you can use the handbrake. Yeah, they operate so, the same brakes? They operate the same yep. brake in the same method. How fast do you think this car goes? 40, okay. 40 miles an hour. And the gas pedal's in the middle. Okay. I'm sitting in the Morris now, and I can't believe how far back you sit from the dashboard. And it's a very lean back position. This is actually extremely comfortable. It's like driving a recliner down the road. And this is your sounds like a sudden right And you're oh, wow. yep. Just like huh. Okay. There's your emergency light. Hmm. Here's your gas tank mm -hmm. with a very fine thread yeah. that you, is almost impossible to put the gas cap back on. There's your spare bulb holders. You might like the big gear down there. Oh, yeah. Is that the speedometer? That's the speedometer. Yeah. C crank only, or does it have a starter? Oh, it has a starter. Okay. Okay, so looks like we have two M types here. And uh, th this is a, looks like a 1212. Correct. Is this a real 1212? No. This is a reproduction of a 1212. But this was started as an M. It started as an M. So this is a double 12. It was because Le Mans was 24 hours of Le Mans. Yeah. In England, they could not run at night. Mm -hmm. So they had two 12 hour races okay. back to back. Okay. During the day. So it has a Brooklyn's exhaust, which was required to race at Brooklyn's. And it's a double 12 because that's the race it was designed for. The, the M-Types were kind of MG's first real production car that, that they had a lot of success making a lot yes. of, of units. Yes. So this is really MG's first successful sports car. That Correct. All the cars before this were produced in a lot smaller numbers than these. And basically, they were modified Morrises. Yeah. Instead of having an MG body. Yeah. So, so these are based on the Morris Minor of the time. Yes. So you you have a twelve twelve replica, a double twelve, and then another M. Wh which one do you prefer to drive the most? Oh, this is by far the most fun. Is it because it's much faster? Yeah, it's got a better camshaft. Okay. So th these engines are two main bearing engines, correct? correct? So they're a little bit more fragile than the later Very series much. cars. Yes. Do you, do you worry much about driving it around? No. So now we're behind a P-Type. This is a PA, is that correct. correct? Yes. 
this one came from Oklahoma City in two big pieces and 30 boxes because the guy that was going to restore it decided it was more fun to jump out of airplanes with parachutes. So I sold us the car. We trailed it back with pieces falling on the highway everywhere mm -hmm. and then proceeded to put it back together. So you've totally restored this car. You had to right. paint it, do everything. Yes. Do you have to rechrome all those bits? Yep. You okay. got to rechrome yeah. it. You got to build the engine, put the drivetrain together, put the body back on. Really, really neat looking speedometer there. <laughs> That's a tachometer, actually. Big tack. Actually, it's both. Oh. Okay. You don't. Oh, you, by the by the RPM, by you can the, then correlate what speed you're going. Correct. It okay. By which gear. Okay. And of course, there's no synchro mesh. Yeah. And you were saying I should have a seat in this one. You should get in this one. Okay. This is my first time in a P-type ever. Nope. 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You have to wear your skinny shoes to drive this one. Yes, you notice how close together the pedals are. Yeah, the, the accelerator pedal is about that wide. Um, so this is actually a four speed. Are the M types, are those three speeds? Three speeds. Okay. And then it's got a neat little reverse lockout. Yes, because otherwise you slam it in reverse and blow, it, blow everything up. Gearbox, yeah. so goodbye. Yeah. The bonnet seems a lot longer than a T-Series car. Yes. You're also sitting a little bit lower. Okay. It has the trafficators on the side up here. Do these one? Do these light up? Do these yes. have lights in them? When they come up, they light up. Yeah. Now, this car is pretty familiar to me. I've had a lot of TDs. Um, what year is this one? 51. 51, okay. When it came to me, it had a... 350 horsepower Corvette engine in it. Okay. With a Hurst shifter. So we had to find an engine and gearbox and mm -hmm. all that for it. Did you put a TD engine or yes. a TF engine? No, it's a TD engine. Okay. Uh, with a Corvette engine, it was totally unsafe. Yeah. I've seen a few two tone TDs. Is that more of an American thing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Was this car two tone when you got it? No. It's an unusual radiator cap there. Yes, it, just what I found. Okay. I like different radiator caps. Okay. Looks like something an MG Club made for a group or could something. Could be, could be. And next up we have a Austin Healey Bug-Eyed Sprite race car. And uh, you, you actually race this car? Years and years ago, many years yeah. ago. Did you race it with SECA? Yes, correct. Okay. And you're just not too far from Blackhawk Farms, I imagine right. you went we there ran, quite a bit. Sure, we ran Blackhawk frequently. What other tracks did you go to? We ran up in Groton, up in yep. Michigan. Um, Road America? Road America is, yeah, yeah. right close by, so yeah. it's not that far. You probably have a logbook somewhere with, with them all in it. I haven't seen that in years either. <laughs> Did you build it into a race car? No, it was built as a new car into a race car. Mm -hmm. It was never titled for the street use. Yeah, so how many owners do you think it had before you got it? Two or three, probably. What's the car back here in the corner? This is a, I think it's 38 VA Tickford. The one next to it is another 38 VA Tickford. Um, the one next to it, there's some interesting pictures on my website on that car. The one that's more taken apart? The that's... one that's more taken apart. Are you planning on restoring both of those cars or turning one and two into one? Or I won't live long enough. Okay. <laughs> this one, the one that's further apart would be the easiest restoration. Okay. Because all the wood is new. Yes. So that would be the easiest one to do. 
So someone was starting a restoration on that one, and then they stopped for some reason, and you picked it up that way? Yes. Well, somewhat. Because we had put the drivetrain together here. Okay. Uh, everything was in pieces, and it went uh, from the guy that did the woodwork, it went through two more owners before it got to me, who did nothing with it. Were you putting the drivetrain in just to save space? Because you, I see you have a lot of stuff around here. Exactly. Okay. Assemble takes up less space than disassemble. Okay, the car in front of us now, this is a really big MG. This is a, another VA. This is 1937, pretty much unrestored. It runs great. I like driving it. When it was in England, it was owned by Ron Williams who at that time was the spare secretary for the SVW register of the MG Car Club. It was then bought by an American in England who later had it shipped to Ohio. But between the time he bought it and it actually got shipped, Ron took it on a European tour for a few months covering a lot of Europe with it before shipping it over to the owner in Ohio. Did it look pretty much in this condition when he did that? Pretty much. When I got it, the engine was seized. We got it freed up and it runs beautifully. And this one has an even more interesting radiator cap there. <laughs> Is there a story behind that? Just another unusual <laughs> radiator cap. Did you put that on there? Of course. Okay. Of course, that's the policeman. The dash is really neat on these cars. Yes. And this is obviously more luxurious, a much fancier car than the sports cars that we've been looking at so far. Do you know what type of person would have owned this car originally? Somebody with money. <laughs> and they weren't cheap. Yeah. I think that, I think I looked it up, they were 280 pounds new, which was a lot of money for someone in England at that time. Uh, now we have a three liter Rover. A friend had it and was into all kinds of different cars and he put it up on the market and I thought, well, we'll buy it. It's a luxury car. Uh, it's an automatic. This car was never imported into the US. So this is a Canadian car. Okay. It's the only place on this continent they sold them and somehow it got brought down to the U.S. So, so you're kind of like me. If you see something neat up for sale, you might end up buying it. Exactly. Okay. Now we have a MG 1100 and a Magnet. Uh, obviously, 1100 is kind of a larger version of the Austin Minis or the, the Morris Minis. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about the Magnets. You don't see these much here in the United States. Well, people that drive it, I have driven it, me included. Says it drives like a bus. Okay. It's not sporty at all. It's what replaced the uh, MG ZB and the, one of the beginnings of BMC's badge engineering program. Believe it or not, this is a Pininfarina design. Uh, I would never have guessed that Pininfarina had anything to do with penning this design because it's 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 not the most beautiful. Italian design I've ever seen. Yeah, it's pretty ugly. Is this another car you just saw for sale and had to have it? And restored it, put it back together and made it run. We showed it for a few years, especially up at John Twist University Motor oh. Show. And since then it's kind of sat. Mm -hmm. Did you get this before you had a lot of the pre-war cars? Yes, okay. yes. You told me you originally had an MGB Roadster. All of these pre-war cars, more of a more recent thing? Came later in life. Okay. As you could afford them. Yeah. And learned about them and figured them out. Now, this is your D-Type, and this is what you had at the show when I met you guys. We, I was actually parked right next to you yes. with my Austin Healey 100. This is just a pretty amazing car. They made very few of these, probably about 250 of these? 251. Okay. This is number uh, 298. And of course, MG started their numbering at number 251, which was the MG 
telephone number. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. So all these pre-war cars, the first one would be number 251. Okay. So this is 298. It was not a real success because with four people in it, the back end dragged. Yeah. So halfway through, they lengthened the chassis by 10 inches to give it more stability. Yeah. But this is a short chassis version of the long chassis D-type. Yeah, and, and these cars were kind of based on the C-type. This was more of a uh, non-racing version of the C-type. Is that correct? No, the D-type is a modified M-type. Okay. So it was based on an M-type. It's the M-type engine in it and gearbox and made into a four-seater. Mm -hmm. So after this came the J1, which mm -hmm. is what the black one in the other building. And these cars were not the fastest cars no. out there. No. It's neat. Right now you have the side curtains and the frame for the top on it right now. I didn't see it this way. Probably right. not a lot of people get to see them this way. We're preparing to get a hood made for this, which is why the the top frame is on and the side curtains are on. So when my people come back, we'll pattern this out. This car has been restored before. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And you showed me earlier when you were showing me around, uh, the, there's a jigsaw puzzle that was made of this car. It, it, who, what brand is that puzzle? Milton Bradley. Okay. You showed me a bunch of postcards there's with this postcards, car. Postcards, oh. wall calendars, pocket calendars, yeah. all done right around 1980. When this car was restored then, it was in somebody's garden in the U in UK in London, and um, when I got it, it was pretty rough shape, and we put it back together. It's basically an M-type engine, but it's got your C-type cam in it, which mm -hmm. gives it more oomph, and it drives beautifully. It's yeah. a nice driving car. What's the thing to the left of the steering column, the, the round thing here? Well, that's your horn and your... Right. High and low beam. High and low beam, okay. So you got a switch on the side yeah. for high and low. So it's the same thing that's normally mounted in the center of the dash. I just moved it onto the column. Yeah. And unlike an M, this has a four-speed transmission in it now. Yes. So, so what's going on here? There's a, a clear Perspex window on the bonnet of this car. That was a dealer bonnet. Okay that the dealers put on to show off the transverse mounted engine and the hydroelastic suspension. So how did this get away from the dealership without putting a normal bonnet back on it? Well, they didn't. Okay. They were only sold with normal bonnet. So this was a dealer only item. So this car was probably sold with a normal bonnet and then right. someone later down tracked down one of these dealer bonnets that's and, and put did. it on this. Yes. Okay, so you did that. Yes, that's what I did. The real bonnet's sitting in the back. Okay. Did you have the car or the bonnet first? Oh, the car first. Okay. Then it just, somebody had it for sale and you just, it's weird enough and you buy it. Yeah. Does this car run and drive? Yeah. Do you use this one? Yep. Yeah, I mean, you take the real bonnet off, put that on and I go, oh, wow. Okay, so you drive it with the regular bonnet yes. on. Oh, okay. yeah, because this is just fiberglass. Yeah, this is just shake like crazy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now in front of us, we have a couple MGBs. They're both rubber bumper MGBs. One's a convertible, one's a GT. The big uh, sunroof in the GT here, uh, the California style that kind of rolls back. Well, the GT, first off, is a... 1980, it was sent to the dealership the same day that the closure of MG was announced. And it was sent to the dealership as a normal MGB GT. It sat on the dealership lot for a year or so. 
and went back to the factory and they changed it from a manual transmission to an automatic. And automatic transmissions in UK spec vehicles stopped in like 74. But they took this 80 and made it into an automatic and then went back to the dealership and was sold. So this one, it's right-hand drive. So this was at a dealership in the UK. Yes. Then sent back to the factory and then sent to be sold in the UK yes. at a dealership. Okay. A friend of ours brought it here. He's uh, in Pennsylvania. He regularly imports cars. No, we went and visited him. I said, I'm looking for a British car with an automatic transmission. And he says, you're standing next to it. Was he looking for an automatic transmission for you? Yes. So do you love driving this car? Uh, we just had it about a year and a half now. So I've driven it a little bit, but I don't like the brakes. Okay. It does not stop like I want it to. A really unusual interior mm -hmm. in this one too. 1980 interior. Okay. Did they do this sunroof as well? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, this has got some unusual options. Do you, do you have any idea how many of these might have gone back to the factory and been nope. done? It's only one we know of. Well, if you know of any cars that were done like this, comment below. I'd be interested to know more about this. Uh, and now, uh, this is the biggest car in the room, I think. This is an MGSA. This is a, a real luxury coupe that they kind of made these to compete with Jaguar. Um, what, what year is this car? 38. Well, this actually was my dream car for mm. a long time. Way back, I think 40 years ago, I was at a MG Car Club show, which was my first time seeing and SA, and I was admiring it, and the owner came up and said, do you like this? And I said, yes. And he flipped me the keys and said, take it for a drive. That was a horrifying experience, scared to death that I was gonna hit something in the middle of a car show driving this, this car. So it took a number of years till we found one for sale, and. Ohio and bought it out of the estate and it's just a great driving car. That car that you test drove was a different car than this one? Was, yes. Okay. The car I test drove is actually in a museum in the UK now. Okay. And when you test drove it, was that here in the US? No, no, at the MG Car Club show okay. in the UK. So here I am driving a right-hand drive car with no synchros in the transmission, around, through, and in a car show. Mm -hmm. You bought it pretty much I in the condition we see it? bought it pretty much in the shape it's in. We did some small items to it, but nothing major. I'm guessing you put the radiator cap on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's Holmes, and it's been photographed many times. Yeah. What's your favorite thing about this car? Oh, it's just, it's a whole impressive thing. The only thing wrong with it is you can see nothing behind you. Okay. That small window does nothing. So we did add a, a backup camera to it mm. so I can see something behind mm -hmm. when you drive it. But yeah, it just drives nice. It's a luxury car. It's got the pillows in the back seat for, for that. It's got a rear window shade for whatever that's worth. It, it's, this is a six cylinder car? This is six. Pretty heavy, no, it's not very peppy. But it will cruise at 50, 55, but mm -hmm. it's not real. Not a real speed demon. Mm -hmm. When you were saying this was your dream car for a long time, how did you first know about this model? At that car show in the okay. UK. That was the first time I ever saw one. You, you hadn't even heard of one until no. you saw it on the show field and you're like, that, that's the most amazing car I've ever seen. Yeah, exactly. Do you still remember what color that one was? Yeah, two-tone blue. 
still remember and still unreal the guy just says here take your yeah. spin you've shown me a lot of cars around here that are still in parts or need restoration of the cars that you have sitting around what's the project sitting that you would like to have completed the most well the j1 okay. in the uh, in the shop i hopefully will re finish at this spring well dennis and crystal Thanks for having me over here. This has been a pleasure. I didn't even expect to see this many MGs, especially pre-war MGs. This is, I don't know if anyone in the U.S. has a collection like this besides you guys. So thanks very much for having me over. Certainly, glad you come. What'd you find there? A bobby hat. Hey, we love you.